Hello, uh, my name's Toby Hulse and I'm from Roustabout Theatre and welcome to this, the seventh in our series of Lights Up On. Um, we're, today we're talking to Shaley Rook and Robin Hemmings, who are actually the other two parts of Roustabout Theatre Company, as you can tell by our matching uniforms. Um, Shay and Robin are both performers, um, but they're also performers who have taken the decision to form a company and to make their own work. Um, so we're going to be talking about what it is their life as performers, but also that challenge of making your own work, forming a company, and hopefully answering some of the questions that you might have. If during the course of this webinar, there's something particular that you'd like to ask either Shay or Robin, um, or indeed myself, um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a little button called Q&A, and you can type your questions in there, and we'll try and answer them, as many of them as we can. So, uh, let's get started. Um, Robin, could you um, outline what you do as a performer? What, tell me about your work as a performer. Um, well, uh, especially different things, like you were saying before, um, about it being a portfolio career. Performing is, see, the main thrust of it, but then there's lots of other kind of jobs that uh, come in to kind of supplement the income, uh, for example, workshops and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but mainly as a performer, uh, yeah, I do sort of, well, plays, <laughs> rehearsing plays and uh, performing plays, but also uh, doing research and development on plays as well, uh, which could be, you know, just reading through a script with somebody who uh, is trying to put a play together or, you know, spending days in a room doing what essentially are rehearsals, but they're sort of the, the early stages of rehearsal where you're still, still trying to flesh out uh, what it is uh, exactly you want to put on stage. And is it mostly theatre that you work for, or do you work in other media as well? At the moment, I do a lot via the, uh, the internet, <laughs> uh, via Zoom. I don't know if you've heard of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, main, mainly theatre. I have done uh, a, a couple of TV commercials and short films and that sort of thing, but um, I've, I've, I think my face is too big for uh, the small screen. <laughs> so it works better at a distance, maybe. Great. And Shay, how about you? What, what, what do you? What's the range of your performance work? So I also mostly work in theatre. Um, and like Robin and through Roustabout, do a lot of devising and um, making my own work. Um, I also do quite a lot of voiceovers as the sort of token Aussie um, go-to voiceover gal. <laughs> for, um, yeah, sometimes for audiobooks or commercials or radio things. So that's a nice little strand that I have going alongside my theatre work. And then I also, um, aside from Roustabout, I make uh, work with a few other groups. So I have a comedy duo and we write and perform our own work. And that keeps me busy when, um, when other theatre work is quiet. Uh, and sometimes I write and make my own stuff. So I've um, written a few uh, shows and um, taken them to the fringe. And so it's quite, um, it's quite a variety, but since I, uh, for, the, for, for the last couple of years, I've, the, work, the work I've been doing, a lot of it has been generated by, I've been producing it as well or involved in the creation of it. So I didn't ever think that, was, that would be the way I went, but um, it is, and I like it. It's a, it's a commonplace uh, when we're, I work at Bristol Old Vic Theatre School and uh, it's commonplace to talk about the, actually the breadth of um, places that you see and encounter the work of performers. So it's not just on stage, film, TV, radio, um, but obviously uh, video games, um, voiceovers, audio books. Um, some years ago we trained the actor who says, unexpected item in bagging area. Um, so all of, all of those all, all of those performances are done by actors um, and it's it's easy sometimes to forget actually how much you encounter the work of performers in your everyday life even if you never go to the theatre um, even if you never saw a film or even if you never watch television you're still meeting the work of performers um, all the time um, you both had different routes into becoming performers um, Robin how, what was how did you start acting and how did you end up where you are today 
Well, um, in some ways, I guess it was a, a, a relatively straightforward path. But I think one of my friends describes me as always landing on my feet. And I, I think I, I, a lot, what a lot of people will say, and I think this come up already in these webinars, is, is I was quite lucky. Um, so when I, when I was a, a child, I liked playing make-believe and dressing up and putting on different hats, which is basically acting. <laughs> and uh, uh, we used to, my next door neighbor and I would watch Indiana Jones and then I would try and faithfully recreate it on our front lawns much to their disappointment. He's just like, can't we just play? It's like, no, this didn't happen in Indiana Jones. It has to be like this. Um, and then my, so my parents uh, sort of noticed that I might be theatrically inclined. Um, and uh, I was lucky they were able to afford for me to go to this uh, Saturday morning theater school called Stagecoach. And I went there for um, quite a few years actually from I think the age of eight to about 16 or something and so I went through I started out as one of the youngest and then ended up being the oldest and for a lot of that period I was actually the only boy in the class as well which had its pluses and minuses <laughs> um, but that really kind of solidified my interest in in, in theatre um, from an early age and, and kind of playing make-believe in a in a structured way, as it were. Um, and then what the high school, the local comprehensive high school near where I lived, every autumn they did a, a musical in the local theater, Paul Lighthouse Theater. Um, and it was great. And they had all the students were involved from backstage to the technical side, to performing and making costumes and everything. It was a really, it was a really kind of wonderful community experience in that sense. And my brothers were in the school when I was, um, and my uh, older brothers were at the school when I was growing up. And so I used to go and watch these shows and my ambition as, <laughs> as a child was pretty, pretty small. I just wanted to be in one of the school plays. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was, it was the first year, I was year nine and not many year nines, um, at that point really auditioned uh, for the for the play because it was it was mainly done by sort of the upper years and six formers but um, I was desperate to be involved and yeah I got in as part of the chorus and I just it was it was the magic of the whole thing um, it was like what you were speaking about that um, last week the the live performance the the one-offness the uniqueness of that particular moment I was just swept up by all of the magic of it. Where that first time walking into the theatre, I can still remember it, just looking up and seeing all the ropes and, and just not having a clue about what anything was. <laughs> just being like, wow, this place is cool. Um, and then obviously there was the buzz of performing. Um, and then I kind of never really looked back. And the following year, um, I, at Stagecoach in the summer, they did Fiddler on the Roof um as their kind of summer play and then just by chance the following autumn uh Caulfields decided to do Fiddler on the Roof as their kind of autumn's show so I knew it like inside out because I'd already spent three or four weeks working on it um and I got a part the part of uh Perchek, I think his name is the uh the student and then the guy playing the main role Tevier uh, he decided to drop out because there's quite a lot of lines and he was uh, really he was like really focused on his A-levels because he wanted to be a, a lawyer. And so uh, the drama teacher, uh, Mr. Tolman, <laughs> he asked me whether I wanted to do it because I already knew the story so well. And that was kind of, uh, it was pretty, pretty stressful. I was 14, but um, that was when I kind of made the decision this is what I want to do as a as a job if it's if it's possible and I never really thought about anything else after that um in terms of what I wanted to do and I was very lucky that um what well, a that Caulfields had such a a passionate and uh inspiring teacher as Mr Tolman in the drama department I think that you know 
again, it's, I think a lot of the similarities with a lot of these webinars has been the people that people have met that have helped you on, on the way. And uh, I think without him, when it got to sixth form and I'd done, you know, plays, had an opportunity to do such great musicals all throughout the school from uh, My Fair Lady to Fiddle on the Roof, South Pacific, uh, Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. You know, it's, it's just great, great experience of, of all these things. Um, and he said, you know, don't go to university, which is what the schools were all pushing everyone to go to university. You needed to do your personal statement. You needed to fill out your UCAS form. You need to go to university. That's the only way that you're going to make it anywhere in life. And uh, my, so my drama teacher said, don't. Try for drama school. It's worth a try and then see what happened. And I knew nothing about drama schools or anything like that. Uh, and I would say to my teachers, <laughs> they'd come up and say, Robin, have you done? I mean, I didn't do much work at school. I was quite lackadaisical. <laughs> and they would say, have you done your UCAS form? And I'm like, no, I don't need to. I don't need to do my personal statement. I'm going to go to drama school. I was so, I mean, naive, I think. <laughs> this is probably the word. But um, I had heard of one drama school, RADA, uh, and then I sort of had this task of using the very slow PC to find other drama schools. And uh, I found this drama school called Oxford and it looked really nice, had really nice pictures on their website. It was, uh, you know, it's set on a farm in the middle of the countryside in Oxfordshire and it looked beautiful. And being a country boy from Dorset, I thought, yeah, this is probably, um, probably the place for me and then when I went and did the auditions rather um I remember walking in and seeing a queen above the kind of the the door as you went in a portrait of the queen I was like Royal Academy I was like oh this is pretty big time and then they sat you down on a table and said you know don't be an actor it's really hot I was like oh this is horrible <laughs> then uh, I thought of, I, I read the perspective the kind of um syllabus of what they covered in Oxford and it was very much rooted in the basic craft of acting. Um, there wasn't, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't much musical theatre stuff. There was a bit of movement, but it was made really more of the acting, which I knew from my experience of doing musicals every year that that was my strong point, singing and dancing. Where, <laughs> not quite um, following suit. Um, and then from that, uh, I did manage to get into Oxford and did three years there, which was amazing. Um, it was just, I think the thing about training for me was the opportunity to learn, to, to practically learn all these different types of theatre, just to do them, just to experience them um, and clown and yoga. And I think even if I stopped being an actor when immediately when I came out, I think that the growth I had as a person would have, uh, um, would have held me, held me in good stead, whatever I chose to do. And then I met you, Toby, <laughs> at the end of uh, drama school, uh, and we did our first job together. And then, yeah, you, you still employ me, so. <laughs> 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 that, that's, that's, I guess, sorry, that was quite long-winded. No, that was, was, was fantastic. And um, showed that this, as you've pointed out, there are a number of themes that are coming up in these webinar webinars, and one is about passion and commitment. One is about the people that you meet and how those people are kind of key gatekeepers. Um, and then there's this sense of a lot of people talk about luck. Um, and I, I'm still quite interested in this idea of, of luck. Um, just you, you mentioned there that um, you know, we, we met uh, through Oxford Playhouse. Um, and that was obviously how you got that job. Um, this will actually answer a couple of questions that have already come in um, from a, one of our attendees. Um, Shay, um, other than the work that you do with Roustabout, how do you get employment as an actor? I mean, how, where do you find these jobs? Um, and how, more specifically, the, the person asking the question wants to know is, how do you know that the company you're applying for are actually worth their salt, uh, trustworthy? I mean. Mm -hmm. How do you get that work? And Robin, do feel free to chip in if you um if you wish. Oh, um, it's a tough question, and it'll be different for every person. But for me, um, you, you, uh, the work that I get aside from Rouse about a lot of it is through 
connections of people who have um, I've worked with and or someone I've worked with has recommended me. So um, there's that there's always a personal connection that um, or there's often a personal connection underneath it. So um, that someone once said in drama school, like learn your lines, be on time and be a nice person. And that third one is really the best piece of advice because the, the easier, no matter how good an actor you are, the easier you are to work with is what that that's what's really going to keep getting you work. So um, but then I'm, uh, you also have to be, I guess, um, quite proactive about seeking out opportunities. So there are, uh, depending on where you're based, I was based in Bristol when I first graduated from drama school. So there was Theatre Bristol and other um, platforms that uh, advertised opportunities and I would look on there. Um, if you're lucky enough to get an agent, then they will help you get that work but um sometimes you find yourself without an agent like during covid right now and i no longer have an agent and so you um you 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 you, you seek them out you seek opportunities out wherever you can in terms of um knowing whether a company is is worth their weight i there's nothing stronger than your gut feeling really and if you don't know them um you know have give them a call, have a chat, see what it is that you feel about them and, and do the research. If they're, if they're, if they have a reputation already on a website and things like that, you can get a sense of their work, but they might be just starting out as really great um, theater makers who haven't done anything yet. They might not have that. So then you have just the early relationship that you start to build with them to go on. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, I've, I used to think that, well, I've learned more and more as I get older to just trust your gut feeling. And if you feel like, oh, I'm not sure about this, then just listen, listen to that. And um, the more I do that, the less astray I wander. <laughs> um, yeah. it's a bit like, just, sorry. sorry, you're about to say something, Robin. Yeah, I'll just say it's a bit like internet dating. You, know, you kind of, <laughs> you, you get, a, you, you, there's the initial sort of thing you go, okay, yeah, this is interesting. I might might like that company, but it, it's you know, it's it's all it's about relationships. I think um, not necessarily romantic relationships, but you know, it's finding whether you have that click. Whether you know, in terms of what 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 do you bring to them, but also what are they going to bring to you, and how is that kind of relationship? How is that going to link you together and and make move all of you on together? Um, but I, I agree with Shay. It's about, um, you know, I didn't, I left drama school w without uh, an agent. I had one meeting with an agent and I, <laughs> I was so nervous because I hadn't really thought past leaving drama school. It was all about uh, going to drama school. And then it, I kind of got to the end of drama school and thought, oh, oh yeah, it's the rest of my life. That's terrifying. And I went to this meeting with an agent and <laughs> You know, it was in Covent Garden, London. I was like, this is the moment. This is everything. This is the pivot your entire life has been working towards. And I couldn't remember a, a single thing. She said, so what casting directors have seen you? <laughs> and honestly, I couldn't, I was so, I felt like I was watching myself mess up an interview really badly. <laughs> but then from there, it's, it's, the, it's fostering those relationships. And I think, as like in drama school, you got to try loads of different um, types of theatre. But I think it really is, is find out what, you know, what floats your boat. Mm. Um, and, you know, you don't need to like all types of theatre and types of performance. Uh, just, you have to find what you're passionate about. And I think a lot of that is just, is, you know, take a little piece from every part of the buffet and meet the people um, and I think a lot of the focus for me was at, at drama school, they, everyone talked about networking and it seemed like such a, a false thing. Um, and it is, if you go into that networking situation mm. to network, to go, right, yeah, what am I gonna get out of this? Um, how can this person, you know, everyone I think who's worked in in the theatre has had those conversations after a show or something where they're talking to someone and that person is scanning the room <laughs> for the next you know who, who's going to help me move on this person's fine for now because I don't want to be seen to be on my own but I really need to talk to somebody else and I think it yeah like Shay said it's about being genuinely nice and interested in the people that you're talking to because luck can come from from anywhere um and so i think is yeah like you said before you just have to 
capitalize on those situations. Mm -hmm. I think something else that's really, that's really helpful is like when you, if you get to know the industry, not just as an actor, but you get to know it as an usher, or you get to know it as a production assistant, or you get to know it as someone who works on box office or behind the bar at a theater. So I just wanted to quickly mention that I had a very different um, way into becoming an actor and a performer and a, or producer than Rob. And I was rejected from lots of drama schools. I moved countries to find a, one that was suitable for me. But along the way, I tried to get a better sense of what the theatre world that I was so desperate to be a part of, what that really looked like and what corner of it I wanted to be a part of. And so I didn't, I, I also dread the word networking, but, um, but you, what I, what you, I don't know, what was a realization for me was that if you're just sort of always being in those bubbles, such a topical way to put it, <laughs> yeah. but if you're always, you know, offering something, even if you're, you don't have yet the opportunity to perform, but you're, yeah, working in, I, I, I'm from Australia, I moved to the States to start with, I worked in a few theaters there, I got to know what that world was like, then I moved here, worked in a few theaters, was a production assistant for a TV company, wanted, wondered if that's what I wanted to do. So I was feeling out not the, the world, not as a performer, just as a person, really, just curiosity and seeing what, and, and offering much more than I was, well, what I thought I was getting back. Now I realize looking back how, how valuable those experiences were and um, yeah, and how they helped shape my career. I've often thought actually, because I went to drama school when I was 19. I had had a gap year, um, you know, where I got a job and got drunk at the weekends and <laughs> lived, I guess, a quite a normal life in a way, and then dwindled away my money. So I went to Thailand for like a month, as opposed to my friends' sort of epic travels around the whole world. But I feel like I was still very much in... Um, the, the kind of institutionalized education world. So I went to drama school and thought, okay, yeah, everything that comes out of the teacher's mouths is correct and gospel and I must follow their lead. Whereas there was people in my class who were older, they were, they were a bit, just a bit more objective. Uh, they had life experience. And I, I mean, I, I don't regret my, well, I have many regrets in my life, but <laughs> I don't regret my path necessarily because that's just how you know it ended up all right. But I do think sometimes, mm, I wonder if I'd spent longer out of the education system before mm. going to drama school and those life experiences, I mean, some of the most moving performances I saw at drama school were from older actors. You know, when I say older, I mean like I was 19, so anyone above 25 was ancient to me. But <laughs> I, I, I think, so how old were you when you went to do that, Shay? When you went uh, to America? So when I first, so when I finished school, I really wanted to be an actor, but I, um, I had been well conditioned into doing something else. And so I thought I'd give that a try. So I went to university and did psychology for four years. And then at the end of that, I was like, I still really want to be in the theater and I'd done shows through university. So then I, but I'd been, at, I'd been at university then for four years. So I wasn't, really looking for another three years at a drama school. I wanted something slightly different. And um, so I was now 21. And in Australia, the, um, the drama school courses were all three years and they weren't quite what I was looking for. So someone in the year above me, a couple of years above me at school, um, who I knew through doing plays, she had moved to New York and done a course there. And so I um, took her recommendation and did the same thing. So I did a short course there when I was 21. And then um, I ended up living there for uh, eight or nine months and then I moved back to Australia and um, that was and I, I had in, the intention to move back to New York and continue my training there but as luck would have it I came across um, the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School who uh, through going down the rabbit hole one night on the internet thinking where do I want to train and they happened to be auditioning in Sydney because the vocal coach of the Sydney Theatre Company trained at Bristol Old Vic and so two weeks later I auditioned and then I got in and I, I mean, I really, I didn't know where Bristol was. This was such a whim. And I thought, has anyone ever decided to move to Bristol over New York before? Well, uh, it's not. <laughs> um, and I, so I'd never been to Bristol. I'd been to the UK once before. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I felt right. You know, I kind of just, it felt like um, the right punt to be taking at that point of my life. And so I moved to, Bristol and then did the one year um, master's course there, which was 
uh, more suited to the, yeah, to what I wanted at, at that point of my life. So I think I was 24, still a baby. I mean, I thought I thought I was approaching being ancient, about to turn 25. Um, but uh, yes, and then I did it a, a year there. Um, and that was, yeah, quite a while ago now. <laughs> Brings us back to gut instinct again. You know, you, you had a, a, a gut feeling that that was the right thing to do. Um, and you follow, you sort of followed your nose a bit, and that's what led you to where you are. Um, I wonder if um, some of that is part of our our decision. We are a company. Our decision to form a company. I'm, now I know the answers to some of these questions, but um, for the benefit of those attending, uh, why why did we decide to form a company, Shay? <laughs> Well, we found ourselves in a car park, wondering <laughs> what to do with our life, cutting out some stars. Um, but jokes aside, uh, I think the essence of it is that we wanted to have some ownership and control and a longer kind of, um, like a longer relationship than you would usually get if you were doing a short contract or a play. You, you know, you work with people for three months and then you then it's then it's over and it's heartbreaking. And I think the three of us had have been working together for quite some time now and that is, is um, a dynamic that really works and we enjoy it and we like the same stuff but we also have different complementary sort of interests or tastes that we wanted to bring together and um, yeah have have some control over what the next phase of our career looks like um, yeah, and I think we, but but a lot of it was a gut instinct. We thought, yes, we want to do this, and we don't really know exactly what that's going to be like, or how we're going to get funding, or if we're going to get funding. But we want to try to make this work. We believe in each other and in the work that we've so far created. So why not try and keep doing it, and and yeah, sort of leap into the unknown a little bit. Mm. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I feel is unusual about Rust about as a company. Um, is the, the point in our careers that we decided to do it. Um, it's really common for graduates straight out of drama school to form companies. Um, some of these are very successful, like Mischief Theatre, which do the, the Play That Goes Wrong series. They're all they were all recent graduates from Lambda, um, and they, they had an idea and they wanted to pursue it. Uh, the Wardrobe Ensemble, who are a fantastic theatre company based in Bristol, um, they were brought together by um, a an after school, after university scheme of Bristol Old Vic called Made in Bristol. Um, Complicite were formed um, by recent graduates from the Coq. Um, so it's really common for that to happen, but um, we've actually chosen to do it later on into our career. Um, why, why did we decide now is the time to do it, do you think, Robin? What was, the, what was our thinking? Because we could have done it years ago. We've known each other for 11 years. Um, I think it, it was uh, all the the ingredients were were right, which maybe um, maybe they weren't before. I think I, I I was I dabbled with with being in a company when I was um, not not straight out of drama school, but not long out of drama school, and I think it wasn't. I was interested in it, but I didn't, I, I wasn't committed to it. Um, I think there was still a lot more things that I wanted to explore and different roads, which I, I felt like I hadn't really gone down far enough in, in terms of the performing, mm. performing world. Um, and I think actually everyone else in the company felt that at the time we were kind of a collective and we came together to make work. And I think there's, there's, there can be obviously lots of different motivations um, all, all at play at the same time, but they sort of different levels, you know, if you think about it on a kind of like a, a dial. Um, and I think at that, at that point, um, we, we weren't all, we wanted to explore other things rather than necessarily know what it was we, we wanted to make. And I think with us, it's, it, we'd, been given a lot of opportunities by different theatres to experiment with ways of which certainly I mean I've done lots of plays with you Toby and we were able to you know given the platform by other theatres to make different types of work 
and I think looking back, you can see, oh yeah, there's that all those shows fit in the same box as it were. Um, or certainly they, they, you know, a Venn diagram, there's, there's a, there's something that, um, links them all. And yeah. And then I think it was just, it was that, that kind of chemistry between the three of us meeting Shay and Shay having, um, you know, bringing a whole new skill set of creating work and, and that kind of, you know, being able to bash a laptop until uh, it's worn through, <laughs> you know, which is something that certainly I don't possess. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a dreamer, not a doer. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I, I, I certainly, part of my motivation, mo motivation was frustration um, that we were coming up with ideas and the, um, the theatre industry is quite slow to respond sometimes. Um, and there's a lot of hoops that you have to climb through. And, and sometimes you just want to grab the idea and run with it. And, um, and we've, the three of us together had made shows which we felt were brilliant. And then we couldn't take them on further as we wanted to. Or we'd had one of those inspirational, wouldn't it be great to do a show about and then no one to sell it to or persuade. Um, and it became clear that actually um, we'd gained enough experience, the three of us, to to do that on mm. ourselves and stop that frustration. Um, just at this funny. point, I'm going to just sorry, Robin. I just want to say, yeah, in that in that conversation, initial conversation that we were having, you know, I didn't go into that conversation thinking I want to make a theatre company. I, that wasn't something I was kind of thinking about at the time really it was only through that conversation of of like you say expressing our frustrations at feeling like the industry wasn't you know wasn't serving us anymore in the way that we wanted it to do um and then so it was kind of coming out of that um which i feel like it was quite an organic process mm -hmm. without sounding too ho 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 <laughs> um, I'm just going to uh, chip in a question here that um, Phoebe's um, given us and maybe Shay you could help us on this one. Um, it's a very very practical question. So what's the process of beginning to set up, up a company and registering it officially? And I know we went through a number of discussions about the best way to do this. So perhaps if we talk about what Roustabout did and then... Um... Yeah sure. So. Um... So you needed first, we needed to first decide what kind of company we wanted to be. So did you want to be, um, you can be a charity, do you want to be a limited by guarantee, limited by shares? We didn't know any of this when we started. It, you, you do a lot of research to quickly figure it out. And I know. Those sensible friends you met at school who went off to become lawyers. That Now they're you really... Um, so we decided that, yeah, that we wanted to be um, limited by, am, am I frozen? You guys are frozen. You did, you did just, for, just for a little moment there, you froze. <laughs> okay, it's just one of my tricks. <laughs> could, could you, um, Shay, could you go back to, we, did, we want needs to work out what sort of company we wanted to be, just in case um, Phoebe didn't hear yeah. that. So we needed to, to decide if we wanted to be a charity, um, a, a company limited by shares, limited by guarantee. And, and when you're thinking about that, uh, you suddenly have to put your sort of business cap on and imagine that you are going to make money in the arts and that in order to run a company you you were going to have to make a profit and that i guess when we thought about all the different um things that we were going to do and the strands that we were going to bring into the company which are not just performing but also teaching and workshops and other offerings like that we decided that the best thing for us would to be um limited by shares um and so it's actually the process is quite straightforward once you've made that decision, um, registering with company's house is, is um, yeah, it, I think it costs about 13 pounds and you get sent a special certificate. Um, <laughs> and then you, the, <laughs> um, then you have to, you have to be quite on top of things like what that, what being a director of a company, what responsibilities you now hold. So you have to learn quickly about, you know, some of the, um, you know, tax things and just that you're going to have to keep an eye on it because you now have this a bigger responsibility as a company. Um, and then you have to choose a name that hasn't been taken before and one that, uh, yeah, one that you feel rep is going to represent the kind of work that you make. And that's, 
that can be a very difficult decision for us. Um, it came quite easily and, and naturally. Um, but Toby already yeah, had the idea. <laughs> yeah, Toby already had a name. <laughs> Tell us, Toby, what is a roustabout? Um, well, a, a roustabout. So in Australia, roustabouts are itinerant sheep farmers. So they travel from farm to farm looking after sheep. Um, and that word was adopted by the American carny folk to describe traveling um, performers, um, but also uh, people working on oil rigs as well. Um, and then there's a really awful Elvis Presley film called Roustabout, in which he plays a motorcycle wall of death rider. And, they, and I guess we're a mix of all three. Great. It's on video now, so I don't have to remember. <laughs> um, actually, the, um, the, uh, the, the official process of setting up the company, after if you can you read forms, is, was fairly straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. The bit that stood us in really good stead were the, were the hours that we spent talking about what sort of work we wanted to do, how we would divide up responsibilities, um, what our key mission statement was, because it actually, um, where we've faced difficult decisions, particularly in the last um, few months, we can go back to the things that we have decided our company's about and say, you know, does, does this opportunity match our vision? Does it, and th those mission statements are more than just something to put on the top of a letterhead. They're actually um, what keeps our company together. And um, although we get on very well most of the time, when 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 there are heated discussions, it's those it's those reminders, you know, what what it is that we're doing and what are our core principles that um that are really important to sort out at an early an early level. Yeah, I, I was just gonna add to that, Toby. I think that's what I think that's what also when you're you know, if you're forming a company with friends, that's what having those things to refer back to are what keep your friendships throughout the, the business side of things because you remember it's it might uh, you, you need to draw those lines between like personal and company those personal and company lines and when you've got things to refer back to that you all decided on that it, it's like it keeps the company healthy personally and as a, and in a business sort of way house rules house rules yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I'd always seen those things as kind of flowery. Oh yeah, oh, mission statement, whatever. And yeah, it's it's. I guess there's a lot as we grow 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 within the industry. You think, oh yeah, no, there is a reason. That's the reason for these things. Um, it's it's not it's not necessarily for anyone else. It's so that you can hold yourself to account of the, you know, am I doing what I set out to do? And I think that's the thing with making a company is. You know, there are lots of different reasons that you should that you want to make a company and they might be different within the group of people. But you have to be you have to be sure that it's what you really want to do, I think. Mm. Um, uh, because part of um, being sure is about the fact we've we've all had to take on a whole load of extra responsibilities, um, things that we weren't normally doing as performers. Um, could you just, um, Shay, just give us a, an idea of, of what extra work you now do, which is nothing whatsoever to do with performance. Okay, so um, I fill in a lot of forms. Some of those are fund, a lot of those are fund um, funding related. So uh, yeah, I spend a lot of time researching funding opportunities, writing, writing Arts Council applications, um, trying to develop relationships with uh, individuals who might be interested in supporting the company. So fundraising is a big chunk um, of responsibility. Then there's, um, I also now, and, and this is a really joyful part of producing. Um, I, I, I sort of maintain the relationships that the company has with theatres and I'm always trying to develop new relationships with different programmers of different theatres. And that really makes you feel a part of the theatre community. And that is so, especially in the last couple of months, that has really kept uh, me but also I'm, I'm sure the both of you going because you feel like yeah you're not a, a lone ship on the sea you're you're all together it's stormy but you, you've got people to talk to so yeah developing those relationships then there's a lot of social media and like marketing which um eats up a lot of your time and actually we recently brought on an assistant producer to help us as the company grows and these responsibilities become larger um 
then yeah and then of course um you know there's i have to sometimes take my producing hat off and put the creative hat on which is much then that 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 person has lots of ideas uh, and when the three of us are musing and then the producer hat says well maybe we can't afford that so we really have to, it's a big job to mute the producer sometimes and just be the creative yeah. to dream and you know be inspired and yeah so it, and but it it takes up you know it's almost a full-time job or it is a full-time job um the funding isn't always there for it but it it, it yeah it's what i do every day now and mm -hmm. and that's a big change in my life for the last yeah over the last 18 months and Robin, you've taken on lots of extra responsibilities as well, which are nothing to do with acting. Oh yeah, flat out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have. I think uh, being um, just just hearing hearing Shay talk about it there, it's about you know building relationships as a company. What you're doing as a you know both Roustabout is a is a business, it's a theatre business, and you know Robin and Shay and Toby, the in individual creatives. They are also a theatre business. So a lot of what Shay was just talking about, building re relationships, researching what opportunities are about, what work is going on. That's all stuff that you should be doing as a, an individual performer. Being, make yourself part of the community. You know, mm -hmm. Theatre is what you love. People will be happy to have you in the community if you're interested and passionate about it. It's, you're not being an imposition. You know, a lot of those conversations that you've had... Sp um, Shay, you know, you've, you've built, um, you know, genuine relationships. Yeah, okay, the link has been through work, like us three, but we all have something similar in common. So I'd say, uh, yeah, following that kind of framework as an individual, think of your, try, take, take the hat off, go, okay, this is me, Robin, the actor, and mm. then I'm going to take that hat off, and this is me, Robin, the producer, or my own manager. Um, and... You know, I'm 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 speaking, but I I, I talk the talk. <laughs> but yeah. I haven't walked the walk, and I often wonder. Think if if I had worked harder, what, what other opportunities might have <laughs> have come up? Um, not that I'm not happy with where I am now. In terms of extra responsibilities for Roust about, it's um, uh, it's, it's administration stuff, which is all the stuff that I kind of, you know, hate doing. I find myself, you know, just getting up and walking away from my laptop and kind of just you know, rocking gently, being like, oh, maybe, oh, no, wait, I'm supposed to be back at the laptop. Go back to the laptop. That's where you're supposed to be. Um, so, like, for example, after we finish this, I will upload it to YouTube and then spend the next three days trying to subtitle it, <laughs> uh, which is something that I've not done before. Um, yeah. That's going to be a very strange metatheatrical experience where you subtitle the bit about your own subtitles. <laughs> That is true. <laughs> um, I, I was, as you were talking, Robin, I was thinking about um, a, a very specific thing, which is if, if, you, if you're doing a show in a theatre and the theatre are advertising it and promoting it, you can legitimately walk into a cafe and say, why aren't there any leaflets for my show in this cafe? Um, and then go and blame the marketing department. Um, if it's your own company, the reason is, is because you haven't got on your bike and taken some leaflets to that cafe and um, there's this yeah. and that that is this and there comes a, a, a great sense of there are many challenges that come with that responsibility but there are also a lot of rewards that come with it and i wonder if we could just quickly summarize what the rewards are of having your own company because there are many and i've been in the last couple of years i've been more fulfilled and happier in my work than i have been for the previous 19. so what are this let's, let's See if we can come up with a reward each. I think what Shay was saying is, uh, uh, earlier actually is, is um, being on a project for, for the length, that, for the, from its birth until its death. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that, that for me is, is really exciting when, you know, if there's time, like you say, there's no flyers in this thing. Oh, the theatre haven't done this. A lot of actors will sit in their dressing room and moan about how terrible the the job is. But um, yeah, you know, and not not necessarily appreciate how much work goes into it. But I think, yeah, it's it's like make you you as an actor, you'll say, okay, I'm working on this show, and then they come in and they'll show you the flyer, and you look at it and go, oh right, that's how they're advertising this show. That's not quite how I saw it. And I think for me, 
being involved in all the little decisions about how it, how it looks and how it's sold and, and what, what it is. I think that, that for me is really exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, and it's sort of about having um, this constantly evolving artistic kind of output that is sometimes or, you know, it's led by the productions in the theatre that you put on, but there's so many decisions that go into it behind the scenes and lot like, I mean, you know, sometimes a whole year before you get to that point. So the reward of seeing something go from an idea to this is the image that we're going to have. This is the trailer. Oh, and now we have the show that is incredibly rewarding and also really creative. So you feel like you can use skills that I, I thought of oh, they're good as an actor, but actually that, you know, if you can imagine or you can dream in the way that you might do when imagining a character, if you can do the same about the image that you're going to sell the show, then I believe that the, the passion and the, um, you, that carries through from the b- very beginning of a project to the end. And when you see it and it works and, and, you know, you, you've devised a show and, um, done all the marketing and, and you do it and people at the end look like they've had a great time it feels amazing it feels like yeah you um it's an inc- it's a really warm and lovely feeling and and you it also makes you check in with it when you're in charge of producing as well as performing the the understanding of the relationship with an audience and with and with theaters and just who are your audience and are we is that conversation working are we providing something that we believe in and we want to make and is it being is it what people need or want or check just always checking in with that and sometimes it doesn't work sometimes you might make a play that you really like and there isn't an audience for it and you have to be honest with yourself but when it does work and it's something that you want and it seems like it's making people happy or feel something that it's just an amazing yeah it's a really amazing feeling it's much the risks are higher but the payoff is you know, the rewards are, are higher. I've, I've really enjoyed um, being able, because we're a small company, um, being able to be immediately responsive to things. Um, so, um, you know, we, we, we create a show, someone says, could this fit in a library? And you go, I don't know, but we'll make it fit in a library. You know, could you create an educational resource for this? I don't know, but we'll work out how we can do it. And just being able to be that fast and fleet of foot and to change, because because there's, there's only three of us essentially, and then with Alice Four, um, you know, we can we can make decisions really really fast. And um, I, I one of the reasons that I teach improvisation is that I get very bored doing things repetitively. Um, I've got a short attention span, I think. And actually that ability to change things constantly, um, which isn't the case if you were, for instance, as Robin was in the mousetrap for 10 months, um, you know, where you, you're stepping in something that's established and has got a tradition and doesn't change that much. Um, that's for me has been the excitement of it. Um, and, and I think uh, a lot with smaller companies. I mean, all the people I've, I work with, uh, generally are, are smaller companies and there you know as soon as lockdown happened the you know the the, the, the army of small theater companies across the world suddenly were like okay we can change this we can adapt to this boom and there was this new stuff out you know new work new mm. ideas people getting their heads together over uh, zoom <laughs> and, uh, and coming up with stuff and i thought it was it, that Although obviously it's a it's a terrible, horrible, weird situation, but that instant response I think has been it's been really exciting to watch, mm. and, and people failing as well. You know, not failing, but you know, it not being, you know, having that space to to fail. And I think it is that for me has been a really interesting thing of this this COVID period is people chucking stuff out and going, yeah, we did this. What do you think? You know, yeah. it's new. And, and the kind of, the support behind that, I think has been, been really interesting. And I, I hope that going forward that this kind of general support of like, yeah, they tried something rather than, oh, you know, the competitiveness might come back a little bit more. Whereas now I feel like we're all working together. Right. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Oh, sorry. 
I just wanted to say quickly on um, one, another reward of having a company is that um, the, and something we've discovered through COVID uh, at the times is um, being able to focus on other ways of connecting with people. So like uh, outreach and development or, you know, when our tour was canceled because of um, everything that's happening, we had to, we couldn't produce shows immediately. So we started to think about other ways that we could connect with um, the, 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 our audience. And that really stretched us as a company and made us like much more robust. And that has been hugely rewarding as well to, to, to kind of like, yeah, I feel like we had one production arm and now we've got another arm. We're, we're like, <laughs> now we're unstoppable. But oh, definitely. I feel like our website has, has great. I mean, when, when we first set up the website, we were sort of going, okay, let's just put a page here and, and write some, stuff so it looks like there's something going on we haven't done that yet but we want to we want people to know that we can do that and i think that has been a real uh, you know we've you, well you've certainly shay i think you know the beginning of covid i was quite happy to go hi <laughs> see you later guys see you later world i'm gonna go hibernate for what three months um and i think you were very much on the front foot of kind of going no, we can do this, we can do that. And now we've got like a whole load of stuff on our website, a whole load of, um, I don't even know what the tab is called. Other work, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so much busier. <laughs> really lame way to describe it. <laughs> um, just before we finish then, um, we have to, ask the, have to ask you both the trademark question. Um, if you were to meet the Theatre Genie and they would grant you one wish, what would that wish be, um, Shay? Okay, so if I met the Theatre Genie, I would wish that he, she, or they would grant me my wish, which is that family theatre isn't something that is children's theatre or like sub adults theatre, but it is a real genre of theatre where children go with adults or with their parents or grandparents and they share this intergenerational experience and that that is something that is much more widely accepted. So we come up against it a, a little bit when we try to sell our shows or, or to programmers and they say, what's the age range? And we say, or oh, seven plus, or five plus. And they say, yeah, to what? We're like 105. There's no upper age limit. We try we try sometimes successfully sometimes not to make work that is really for a wide age range like that and i think that that kind of work um is is really special because it, if it, if you value a child's um experience of the theater the same way as an adult the same way as a grandparent that they sh they share a conversation about that experience that is that will be rich and illuminating and um uh, and I, yeah, I'm quite passionate about it. You can probably tell. Um, but I think films do it really well. And uh, I think the theater industry could do it better. Um, and also for that work to not just be in the summer holidays and Christmas, but for that to be like a really valued um, bracket of theater, wide bracket of theater. That's my wish. Fantastic wish. Uh, Robin, what would your wish be? Yeah, yeah. Just following on from that, I just say it's the cock of the head as well, isn't it? Oh, family theatre. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Cool. It's like no, it's not nice. It's actually rather urgent, you know, because that <laughs> that's the future grey-haired audience that are going to keep the regional theatres afloat. And if they're not interested now, then you know, kiss your career goodbye in the future. But my wish, if I met the theatre genie, would be, um, I it, it's it's very selfish, but I think it. The, uh, I'm always jealous when I hear the stories about the old rep, the old rep seasons. And I just wish that there was, um, obviously there's still a few about, but I just wish they were as prolific as they used to be. Uh, because m the most fun I had at drama school was in the second year where you were, um, neatly cushioned between the weird scary first year and the even scarier third year and you just had an op we just were able to play literally play from restoration clown shakespeare brecht Chekhov. you know all these wonderful writers we were able to play and live those stories and really understand what great great writing is and great theater is uh and i just think that would be to be involved in one of those seasons and or to just have the opportunity to, to and, and not just for me, but for, you know, across the board, 
if there was more of those opportunities for actors, I think, you know, you, everyone talks about like the greats at the moment, the great actors, and they all went through the reps in the 80s, 70s, 80s, building up to that. Um, and I just think that would be, and what a, what a lush experience as well for, you know, I grew up in Dorset, there wasn't much, you know, wasn't a lot of theatre in Dorset, and I certainly wasn't aware of it. Um, but, you know, to have those rep seasons available for people so that, that those stories were, you know, being performed across the country. You didn't have to, you know, fork out to, and go to a major city to see that kind of work. What that work should be happening on people's doorsteps. Right. Um, I read an article recently which suggested that the return of rap theatre would solve the um, bubble problem because you can have a cast that you keep together in one house and they could perform a different play every week. So maybe your wish will come true, Robin. Who knows? Um, I mean, thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank um, you both very much. Um, as always, it's a delight to talk to you. And thank you to the Arts Council of England, whose emergency response funding have made these webinars possible. Next week, uh, we'll be talking to Bronya Houseman, um, who is a designer. And I'd just like to mention, Robin said earlier that... Um, one of the important things about working in this industry is the people that you meet. Um, whilst we can't meet you in person, um, we're really interested in talking to any of you or giving you advice or mentoring you um, in any way of those of you who are interested in entering the industry. Um, and you can contact us via our website, which is roustabouttheatre.co.uk. And hopefully um, we'll be able to help some of you out. Um, thank you all very much and uh, hopefully see you next week. Bye. Mm -hmm.